Look for me in the mountains where walking has a way of pulling you to your peace of mind every day. Welcome to the Backpacking Light Podcast. I'm Andrew Marshall. And I'm Ryan Jordan. And today's episode is a skills short. In these episodes, we focus on a backpacking skill and give you some actionable resources, advice, and recommendations to either get started or advance your current skill set. Today, we're going to be talking about Tinkara fishing. So Ryan, there's an old line about golf being a great way to spoil a good walk. And uh, I have to admit that I've always just personally felt similarly about fishing. I think of it as a good way to interrupt my bourbon drinking next to beautiful lakes. So are you telling me that fishing can be simple and enjoyable even for beginners? I would never ask you to give up uh, bourbon in the middle of a glass by an alpine <laughs> lake. Tell me what your barrier to fishing is. Let's start there. Um, it seems like uh, a lot of fiddly bits of gear that can get tangled up. Um, and, and there also seems to be a language and a skill set and um, a knowledge base that seems very overwhelming to try to, to dive into if you don't already have a, a passing familiarity with it. Yeah, let's talk about this. This is unique to Western culture in general. I love hearing the sound of your kitty during the podcast, by the way. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> but the, if you look at Western fly fishing, what we've got is this this situation where this incredibly beautiful, simple sport has been commodified and commercialized. And so this is the, the reason that companies like Orvis and Cabela's exist is to create this massive retail industry, um, around the sports of hunting, fishing, hiking, you can apply this to uh, backpacking as well, obviously. So in Western fly fishing, you have a fly rod, a fly reel, a fly line, leader, tippet, hundreds of different types of flies, different types of fly boxes, um, strike indicators, split shot, all these other uh, things that are seem mandatory in order to get into the sport. And then you've got, you know, the fishing vest and the waders and the wading boots and it, the list just goes on and, and, the, and the tools, there's, there's all these little tools you can buy. So you're, I've seen fly fishermen sitting on the river in, in Colorado or Wyoming or Montana who are straight out, they are models straight out of an Orvis catalog. And they literally are carrying a vest that might be loaded down with 15 pounds of equipment. For backcountry travel, that's obviously not practical. So one of the trends that we've seen in the last 15 years is this return to what we call simple fly fishing. And it's based on the Japanese method of tankara, which is a very small, light, collapsible rod called the tankara rod, a line, a short line that can be attached to the end of that rod and a fly. And that is literally all you need to enjoy fishing in the backcountry. Now there's advantages and disadvantages to the method relative to a traditional rod and reel method in Western fly fishing. We can talk about that if you want, but for the most part, um, in the backcountry, I like my gear to get out of the way so that I can enjoy the activity more. And it's Tinkara is lighter. It's simpler and anybody can learn how to do it, whether it's a child or somebody who's never, ever fly fished before. Okay, so let's say I wanted to get into Tinkara. Uh, what do I need and where can I find it? I think the, the basic things are a Tinkara, a, a Tinkara rod, a Tinkara line, and a fly. And most Tinkara rod companies will sell packages containing these basic things. Um, Tinkara USA is the original kind of t Tinkara tackle distributor here in the United States. They're based out of Boulder, Colorado, and they sell packages or you can buy rods individually. Tinkara Rod Company is a little bit uh, down market in terms of quality, but also offer great entry level packages for people. Or you can geek out on Tinkara just like you can everything else 
and buy an authentic tenkara rod from a Japanese maker. Um, and you know, then you're up into, uh, you know, several hundred dollars. Uh, but, but the goal is what, how can we minimize what we need to get into the sport? And the solution is a rod, a line and a couple of flies. So are you, so help me out here and maybe anyone who's used to, to so quote unquote regular fishing, how are you getting the fish to the shore? That's a great question. So, um, as a, you know, here's a Tinkara rod for those of you who um, are watching the video podcast, which is available to our unlimited membership. I'll, I'll do a show and tell as I talk here. Here's a typical Tinkara rod. This is a Tinkara USA Hane. Uh, this is the older model. They've updated it with uh, a nicer finish, but this is the original one that we distributed uh, a decade ago. So there's no reel. So you can't reel a fish in, right? So you, And these rods are longer than conventional rods. So they're you know, 10, 11, 13, even 14 feet long. And then you've got a short line attached to it, which is anywhere from you know, about the length of the rod to maybe one and a half to two times the length of the rod. So the line length total is, you know, 10 to 20 feet usually. And so the, the idea is if you have a fish on, instead of reeling it in, if you're using a short line, there's a couple of different techniques. One is to hold the rod up as high as you can, bring the tip of the rod backwards to pull the fish in a little bit closer so that you can reach down and handle the fish. The second technique is to um, walk backwards on the shore and land the fish on the shore. That causes some stress to the fish. So if you're into catch and release, that is a less desirable method. And then the third method is to, um, is similar to the first one, holding the rod tip high and then grabbing the line with your other hand and slowly line in the fish until you can reach it. That's really interesting. You know, with when you minimize your gear and you start relying more on skills than on gear, I think one of the things that can happen is you end up with a, a more intimate relationship with mm -hmm. with what you're doing and you're more aware of nature or your body or what, whatever your task is. And it seems like that might be the case here too. It's absolutely the case, especially when you actually get a fish on the end of the rod because – you feel so much more of what's going on. It's not dampened by a stiff rod and you don't have a reel that is um, kind of protecting the fish's ability to break off your line. So a tremendous amount of skill is required on your part in order to, you know, move the rod back and forth and change the angle of that rod so that when, a, when you get a large fish on that's fighting hard, um, you are part of that, that process and, uh, a much more skill is required to prevent it from breaking off. Now at the same token, these Tinkara rods are so limber at the tip that they're very forgiving. And I've, I've caught some enormously large fish on Tinkara rods that really, really surprised me. So, you know, barring, you know, steelhead or trout in the 10 pound range, which can be caught on a Tinkara rod. And I've successfully done both of those. The, the rod itself is very forgiving. And for most Alpine fishing where the fish are relatively small, you know, 16, 18 inches or less, uh, it's proven totally adequate. So let's talk about line and flies. Are those things different than in traditional fly fishing or is it the same stuff? They are absolutely different. A traditional fly line is fairly thick and fairly heavy. And the line has to be matched to the rod, the rod stiffness. And so it gets complicated if you want multiple rods. You have to have a line that's matched to that rod. And usually that line is stored on a reel. And so you end up getting several rods, several reels, and several lines that you have to deal with. A Tinkara line is a little bit different. So I'll, I'll hold one up here. This is a, a braided Tinkara line. And it's, it's very, very thin. It's made of monofilament. You can get them uh, made of uh, silk and Dacron as well. But the idea is it's a very, very light line, much lighter than a traditional fly line. And again, you have these really flexible tips on a Tenkara rod that allows you to cast this line without the line having to have 
weight to it. In traditional Western fly fishing methods, the reason those fly lines are so thick and so heavy is because they have to load this relatively stiff rod in order to cast them for any distance. You don't have that in a Takara rod. You have a very delicate tip, a very delicate line, much easier to cast, much less energy required to cast them. In terms of flies, you know, usually at the end of your line, you're going to tie a section of monofilament leader to it. And you're going to tie a fly on the end. Let's see if I can hold up this Tinkara fly to the camera so it can focus. There we go. So you can see the fly there. And it is what's known as a reverse hackle fly. This, this part right here is the hackle. And the idea is as you're pulling that fly through the surface, those little feathers uh, move and that's what entices the fish to make it think it looks like a bug. So that is the traditional method of Tinkara fly fishing is tie a fly to a piece of monofilament, tip it that's attached to your Tinkara line, cast out, usually the fly will sink, and then you impart motion to the fly by um, flicking the rod with your, with your wrist. And that's the basic core method of Tinkara. Now there's a whole bunch of other techniques and tricks you can do to impart different types of motion to the fly. You don't have to impart motion at all to the fly, um, but that's, that's the basic design behind, behind the Tinkara reverse hackle fly um, option. And is there a culture of like boutique fly tires in the Tinkara world, just like there is in the, in the traditional fly fishing world? Um, I would say there is, there is traditional Tinkara method and equipment, and then there's modern Tinkara method and equipment. Let's talk about traditional first. And by traditional, I mean authentic Japanese Tinkara as it's practiced over there historically. And so in traditional Japanese Tinkara, um, these flies have um, th silk thread bodies and very sparse hackles. And usually a silk loop is sewn into the fly as the means to provide a loop to uh, tie the line to the fly. Now, in a traditional uh, Western fly fishing culture, flies look way different. And so we can take something like this, which is a kind of a grasshopper imitation that is made out of foam and you've got, you know, synthetic materials, a long hook shank, um, kind of a crazy looking thing with rubber legs and all this kind of stuff. If you, if you tied this on the end of a Tankara line and were fishing with, with somebody who um, practiced traditional Japanese Tankara, they'd probably have a heart attack. So there is definitely a... A, an authentic way to practice the sport and I authentic's not the right word traditional way to practice the sport and then there's there's modern western fly fishing techniques and there's no question that the two have melded mm. now mm -hmm. some purists will say well that's not tinkara then well it is you're you're fishing with a tinkara fly rod and you're using tinkara techniques to impart motion to the fly and the type of fly that's on the end of the end of the rod is probably not as relevant as the technique to um, fish with. Okay. And what about some of the other accoutrements that tend to go with Western fly fishing? Is there any need for things like strike indicators or things like that in Tinkara? Um, for the beginners who are fishing with flies underneath the surface. I think a strike indicator can be incredibly valuable. Now with Western fly fishing, you have this heavy fly line strike indicator and a, you know, six or eight or 10 foot, uh, section of tippet on the end before you get to your fly. It's not like that in Takara. So I've taught beginners by putting a strike indicator three, four or five feet above their fly and, and training them to watch the indicator because, um, that can indicate when a fish is taking your fly. It's really difficult to see that as a beginner without a strike indicator. That said, I encourage people who are setting out for their first time fishing Tinkara 
to try to monitor the Tenkara line itself as it enters the water. And you can get to the point, assuming you have good vision, where you can see minor, minor bits of motion in that line that indicate a strike. So eventually, the strike indicator can be discarded once your skills improve. And this, I think, is an important step towards practicing Tenkara because if you can get the strike indicator off your, off your fly line, then you are able to have much more control over where that fly is in the water and the type of motion you can impart to it. So that's strike indicators. Second thing is a lot of people will try to add split shot to get down deep so that they can fish a fly deep in the water column. Uh, a lot of times fish will hang out near the bottom of a stream bed and you need to get down to, um, to reach them. And split Which shot is, is a weight, is a, is a weight. It is. The line. Yeah. Yep. It traditionally has been made of lead, although that is completely frowned upon now because of lead is so toxic to um, aquatic fisheries. But uh, we can use uh, non-toxic materials like tungsten and things like that now. But the split shot really isn't necessary for Tinkara. It can be used as a crutch. But the, the lines are so thin in Tinkara that they sink pretty darn well, unless you're applying some kind of treatment to them. So based on the direction of your cast and where you drop that fly into the water, or how fast the water is moving, what types of currents are leading down to the fish that you're trying to reach, you can do a lot to ensure that that fly gets down to the bottom of that water column without using split shot. And again, this is part of the technique of Tinkara. But if we take away strike indicators and we take away split shot, two things happen. One, we have more control over what that fly can do in the water. So it's not just sitting there dead. And we can feel the strike of the fish much more readily than we ever could with Western fly fishing. With Tenkara, um, you can hold the rod above the water with a relatively tight line. And you can feel a fish bite your fly once you get pretty good at it. You can never do that in Western fly fishing. You have to have a strike indicator, and it's really difficult to get flies down in the water column without weighting them. Hmm. All right. Any other tools that, that stick out to you that, that Tinkara anglers may or may not need, depending on the use case? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll share what I use. And so I've got a, a very small bag here that I use to actually house my gear. It's just a small zippered bag. Um, it, it weighs a little more than an ounce. And I keep my fly box in here. I don't use a traditional Tenkara fly box. I use a foam fly box because I have a habit of dropping it and I want it to float because I don't want to lose uh -huh. my flies. Uh -huh. um, and then I carry a couple of different weights of tippet. I have a 3X spool of tippet, which is a little bit thicker, and that's used um, a short section to connect the Tenkara line to the rest of your your leader, your tippet. And then most of what the rest I use is something like a 5X. Sometimes I'll bring a 6X if I'm using very small flies. And this just a little bit finer tippet that um, the fish have a harder time seeing and allows you to be a little more stealthy when you prevent, present the fly to them. In addition, it gives the finer tippets give the fly a more natural motion. I do carry a tiny dropper bottle that is filled with very, very small split shot. I rarely use it. The only time I will, I will use this is when I'm lake fishing and I know I need to get my fly down deep to trout that are very wary. Um, other than that, I do carry a small tube of floatant and that floatant is used uh, when I'm fishing dry flies in turbulent water and I want that fly to stay afloat on the water. Other than that, I have a small pair of nippers that I use to cut the line so I can save my, my front teeth from doing that. And then a pocket knife just so I can uh, clean fish if I am eating fish on a trip. Um, other than that, the only other thing I really like to have is a line holder. And that's what this blue spool device is here and the line holder is kind of nice because you can slide it over the um, 
end of your, your fly rod and up onto the cork handle. And this can be a way for you to carry the rod um, with the line attached easily so that you don't have to put the line away every time. And what about what about nets? Is there any reason to bring a net with you? So I'll show you this net here. This one has a carbon fiber handle. It's got a titanium ring on it and a, a light net. It only weighs about two and a half ounces. Um, I'm a big fan of nets in two scenarios. One, if you're fishing lakes and you're fishing for large fish, trying to manage a large fish coming into a lake shore with a Takara rod can be very challenging. And if you just let them flop onto shore, you might do damage to their, their mucous membranes at the skin mm. surface, which makes them more prone to disease. So handling fish delicately, delicately, if you're in a catch and release situation is really important. Now this net, I would never use anymore because we now know that this fabric causes damage to that those skin membranes and so there are now quite a bit of research has been done on fishing nets and so now we have access to um, nets that are are made of a siliconized material almost like a, a silicone rubber that does not damage the mucous membranes mm -hmm. on fish and so some of the new tankara nets are a little bit heavier because of this mesh material but much safer to the fish so again mm -hmm. back to back to my scenarios large fish in lakes. And then the second scenario is if I'm fishing in a very sensitive fishery and catch and release, I always want to use a net. I want to keep the fish in the water. I want to handle it as little as possible. So a net allows me to just bring the fish in, let it, you know, chill out in the shallow water while I remove the hook. And then I can just drop the net to the side and allow the fish to recover and swim away. Hmm. All right, well, let's talk skills. I, I, I'd like to talk about some skills for raw beginners, and maybe some resources that, that raw beginners could use. And then also for people who are listening to this and they're like, okay, well, I, I've already done some car fishing. How do I go to the next level? I would say the first place to start is to go to Tinkara USA's website and look at their video library. Uh, the founder, Daniel Galhardo, has done an outstanding job creating introductory fly fishing videos. Highly recommended. The two other resources I recommend are Daniel's book, which is simply called Tinkara, and it's available uh, most places where you can get books nowadays. The other book I really like is this one, which is called Simple Fly Fishing. It's written by uh, Craig Matthews, who's the founder of Blue Ribbon Flies. Uh, in West Yellowstone, Montana, one of the most um, revered fly shops in the country. Yvonne Chenard, who's the founder of Patagonia, and Moro Matzo, who is a very skilled Tinkara educator in his own right. And Simple Fly Fishing goes into quite a bit more detail, um, talks about techniques, provides some very um, entertaining and interesting stories about Tinkara fishing. And just both of those books and then Daniel's videos are a fantastic resource to start out. It's also probably worth pointing out here that um, the same week we're releasing this podcast, we're also at BPL publishing a gear list written by one of our authors, Mark Weatherington, who's an avid tin car fisherman in uh, the northern Rockies in Montana. And uh, he's got a pretty accessible um, entry-level explanation of the gear that he uses and the rationale behind each piece of gear that he takes with him on his uh, fishing trips. I love Mark's article because he goes into quite a bit of depth behind the decision making that allows him to choose the gear he wants and and makes it, um, as you said, accessible to the reader in case they want to explore a few different options. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, as we wrap up here, we've been going for about 25 minutes. Um, if I had to ask you, what is one purchase or one skill that would have the biggest impact on an angler's enjoyment using the tin car method. What's the best investment of time or money that someone could, could make to, to really maximize their enjoyment? I would say lighten your traditional backpacking backpack. And the reason I say that is because I have spent some of my, my favorite time tin car fishing along streams while I'm wearing my backpack. 
And so the ability to keep a Tenkara rod handy and wear a light pack and explore fishing en route between campsites as you go, to me, that's been one of the most rewarding thing. Traditionally, it's, it's like get up in the morning, break camp, pack up, um, hike all day, get to another campsite in the evening, and that's where you fish. And lightweight backpacking has completely changed how I look at fishing because now I start planning routes that are along and through river corridors so that I can fish mm -hmm. along the way while wearing my pack. And Takara makes that really accessible because the whole thing um, compacts down into this little tiny package and you can slide that rod with the line attached and everything into the side pocket of your backpack and have hmm. access to it at any time where a traditional Western rod, you know, you got to sit there and either carry this long thing, which is horrendous while you're bushwhacking, bush, bushwhacking, or you have to put it away in between your fishing destination. So to me, start with a light pack and then maybe change how you look at uh, hiking routes and start looking at stream corridors. I love that. The thing that stuck out to me the most about Mark's article is that he said he doesn't necessarily catch more fish than his friends, but he's always fishing faster than they are and, Definitely. and having more fun doing it. Definitely. And the, the thing I, I think I love about Tinkara more than anything else is that I can put a Tinkara rod in a, in a four-year-old's hands or a five-year-old's hands and catch fish with them within minutes. You can never do that with a Western fly fishing method. So with Western fly fishing, you know, you, as the adult, you kind of have to do that, get the fish on and then hand the rod to the child so they can reel it in. And I've literally put rods into the hands of, uh, young kids who are not much bigger than toddlers and they've been able to do everything by themselves. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, we will definitely put links to all the resources we mentioned in the show notes today, uh, which you can find by going to backpackinglight.com slash podcast. And uh, in addition to that, if this episode inspires you to take up the sport, send us a line. Uh, we would love to hear from you if you used any of the skills or resources that we mentioned to uh, learn a new skill today. So that's going to do it for this episode of the Backpacking Light podcast. The Backpacking Light podcast is advertising free thanks to the membership fees paid for by Backpacking Light members. A backpackinglight.com membership gives you access to 20 years of archives, forums, and online courses. So please consider supporting this podcast and become a member right now at backpackinglight.com slash subscribe. And you can download the show notes for this episode at backpackinglight.com slash podcast. And we'll put resources we talked about in there as well as some links to some of the Tinkara gear that we have experience with so you can uh, see some options. And if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps other people find the show. Thanks for listening to the Backpacking Light Podcast. I'm Andrew Marshall. And I'm Ryan Jordan. And if we can leave you with one parting message, it's this. Pack less, be more, because lighter is better. So I shouldered my backpack, walk away from the car. 